Promoters say the only way it ends is if a doctor intervenes, the fighter gives up, passes out, or dies on the mat. Critics claim it amounts to nothing more than a human cockfight. Each match will run until there is a designated winner by means of knockout, surrender, doctor's intervention, or death. Is Jack Kevorkian the referee? You say it's entertaining. Feeding Christians to the lions was entertaining. Every November, the UFC celebrates the anniversary of their first ever event, the birth of modern day mixed martial arts, ushered in by the legendary Gracie family. It is one of the most seminal moments in the history of the sport, a clear catalyst for what would eventually become a multi-billion dollar industry. The largest deal in the history of sports will officially be revealed to the world this morning by the UFC. We have the information tonight, a four billion dollar deal. Yeah, four billion. One didn't realize that UFC was that big and would command that much money. And while that night is all the wonderful things that have been said about it in countless documentaries, books, and articles, just below the surface, an undercurrent of skepticism about its legitimacy has run since before the event even took place. And even though these concerns have been largely washed out by the mainstream mythologizing of UFC 1, the questions remain to this day. How fair was that first event held by the Gracies won by a Gracie? Was this entire tournament a carefully ordered orchestrated advertisement for Gracie Jiu-Jitsu in the guise of a legitimate competition. Who made the major decisions? Where did these other fighters come from? Who was not included and was it on purpose? Why did the event play out like it did? Is this entire sport built on a lie? They picked the fighters. Oh, really? They picked, or in Gracie, picked the fighters. Right. Seems to me like it's a, a two-hour advertisement for Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, which uh -huh. is what it turned out to be. We celebrate this event every November, and rightfully so, but there's so many questions unanswered, and it's time we found out the truth. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and this is MMA Unsolved. Was UFC 1 rigged? I just finished our last investigation when I decided to take a few days off to recharge my batteries. Doing what I always do when I'm exhausted, mindlessly watch YouTube videos about anything but mixed martial arts. About five Elden Ring lore videos in, a thumbnail in the suggested viewing caught my eye. Despite my best efforts, another mystery had found me, probably because of the month I spent searching for fixed fights. Can I have no peace YouTube algorithm? The video was titled The Gracie UFC Conspiracy by Jesse Encamp, and it had 1.3 million views and 30,000 likes. The thumbnail claiming in all caps, Gracie fooled everyone. I was not in the mood for work, but crime never sleeps as they say, and if the video was that popular, it certainly warranted looking into for our unsolved series, so I reluctantly clicked. Before I tell you what it is I found though when that video began to play, we need to pause here and rewind just a bit, as in all the way back to 1993. See, as silly as it may seem, I can't assume that we're all on the same page as it relates to our knowledge of the first ever UFC card. And so if you'll indulge me very briefly, I'd like to quickly recap the events of the evening of November 12th, 1993. It was a frosty night with a high of 37 that felt more like 20 due to the 18 mile an hour winds. I'm sure the thin air 5,279 feet up from sea level did no favors either. At the McNichols Sports Arena, home of the Denver Nuggets, 7,800 people with 86,000 more at home witnessed the birth of mixed martial arts in the United States. The one night eight man tournament dubbed the Ultimate Fighting Championship was the brainchild of Conan the Barbarian director John Milius, ad executive Art Davey, and Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Grand Master Horian Gracie, son of the legendary Elio Gracie who was a founder of the gentle art. The event was exclusively available on pay-per-view for $14.95 US, distributed by Semaphore Entertainment Group or SEG, and featured eight martial artists from various disciplines. Gerard Gordeau, a saboteur from the Netherlands, Tila Tuli, a Hawaiian sumo wrestler, Kevin Rozier, a kickboxer out of Buffalo, Zane Frazier, an LA-based Kimbo Karate fighter, boxer Art Jimerson from St. Louis, Patrick Smith, a third-degree black belt in Taekwondo fighting in his hometown of Denver, Ken Shamrock, an American shoot fighter trained in Japan, and finally, Hoist Gracie, younger brother of event organizer Horian, representing Brazil and, of course, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. The eight men would be fighting in a padded cage shaped like an octagon, later dubbed well, the octagon. The rules were simple. No biting, no eye gouging, and fights go on as long as they have to in infinite five minute intervals, or just five rounds depending on who you talk to, until somebody taps, snaps, or throws in the towel. Everybody gets a grand for being there, runner-up gets 15, and the winner 50. The pay-per-view kicked off quite literally with Gordeaux punting Thule's teeth into the stands for a 26 second TKO victory in the first quarter final bout. Next, Rozier defeated an exhausted Frazier when his corner mercifully threw in the towel after four minutes 
minutes. Gracie would submit Jimerson in under three minutes. Shamrock would submit Smith in under two. The semifinals began with Gordeaux earning a corner stoppage win against Rozier in just under a minute, which is about as much time as it took Gracie to submit Shamrock. Then following an alternate bout that took place right before the finals for some reason, and a ceremony honoring Elio Gracie that was booed by the board crowd, the championship round took place and would see Hoist secure yet another submission to defeat Gordeaux and become the first ever UFC tournament winner. The rest, as they say, is history. All right, now that we're all caught up on the general concept of UFC 1, let's watch this conspiracy video. To my surprise, when it began to play, I was immediately met with Bill Supervote Wallace. Is it straight? <laughs> oh, now, yeah. <laughs> Trick for you to fix it <laughs> Okay, okay, got it. <laughs> the first ever play-by-play -play commentator in UFC history. He was there on that historic night calling the action and had spent a lifetime in the martial arts. So I was immediately intrigued by what he was doing in the video and what it is he had to say. Fast Billy, who claims one of the reasons he was not brought back for UFC 2 was because he asked too many questions, had quite the tale to tell indeed, essentially implying that the entire event was a setup to ensure Hoist Gracie came out of the tournament victorious. Wallace's five key claims are as follows. During the event, someone was guiding his commentary. When the fights happened, I have a guy sitting beside me yeah. from the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu telling me what to say about the Gracies. So as to so as to push the Gracie. So uh -huh. basically I'm thinking, oh, something doesn't sound right here. Right. Seems to me like it's a, a two-hour advertisement for Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. Tila Tuli was not allowed to continue his quarterfinals bout with Gerard Gordeaux, not because of his missing teeth, but because his size would be problematic for Hoist. If this guy can hit this guy with his best shot, two best shots and nothing happened. How's Hoist gonna take him down? Oh. Hoist gonna get dropped out for the double leg. Yeah. Maybe he just flattens out on his back. Ooh. <gasps> yeah, yeah. Now he let Hoist on his stomach flatten out. This guy's going, ah, and you're, yeah. <gasps> no, yeah. So, so they wanted him out. Sure. Yeah. Art Jimerson, Gracie's first round opponent, was purposely sabotaged prior to the fight. One of the guys who was a really good boxer asked him not to use the smoke because he had asthma. So they used the smoke anyway. He's coming out there about halfway through the matches. <gasps> oh, so like smoke machines. Sure. He go, now hold it just a minute. What the, what the hell's going on here? Yeah. There was no specialized gear allowed, except for hoist. And I, plus he was the only one, the only one yeah. that was allowed to wear a uniform. The other guys couldn't even wrap their hands. No. But he was allowed to wear the uniform. And you got guys that, that because you, I want to wrap my knees. No, you can't wrap your knees. No. But Hoist is allowed to wear all that stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, you go, hold it, what that, what? I don't understand this. Yeah. Finally, Wallace claims that the other seven competitors were hand selected to fare poorly against Hoist by his brother. Or in Gracie, pick the fighters. So they probably picked fighters that would look good against Brazilian. Of course it would, yeah. Because yeah. you got to stand up, the hands are here. Right. How easy is it now for you to drop down and do a double? A double, down? yeah. Because they've never seen it before. Right. They had never seen a takedown before. No. They're stand up fighters. Now, I'll be honest, I was a bit underwhelmed by what Superfoot had to offer here, especially considering this video had so many views and likes. And if you've been a fan for any amount of time, you've probably heard the things he's saying. And sure, while there were some interesting points, if they were true, it seemed like a bridge too far just from that information to call one of the most seminal events in the history of the sport rigged. I had a starting point though, and I decided a proper investigation was needed in order to determine just how legitimate these claims actually were. My research led me through countless interviews with all parties involved, a multitude of books that are either directly about the first UFC event, or at some point gave first-hand accounts of the card and its development. There is a ton of content out there about UFC 1, as you would imagine, given the event's importance. And so, drowning in primary sources, I decided I would tackle Wallace's claims one by one. The first accusation that honestly had me rolling my eyes as soon as I heard it was that Thule was not allowed to continue his first round fight because he would literally squash Hoist Gracie. While I'm sure that is true, of course, that Hoist would have never been able to get up if that man was on top of him, proving once and for all that Nate Diaz's sumo style wrestling is the best base for MMA, the story just doesn't add up. When you watch the fight itself, Jiu Jitsu Federation referee Joao Alberto Bajedo, who was hired by Horian because of his understanding of Jiu Jitsu, is seen arguing with Gracie, who, wearing a full on tuxedo, seemed enraged at the stoppage. Even yelling over to Thule's cornerman in English, is he good to go? And the reason Horian was going ballistic over this stoppage is because the rules specifically explained, and there are many accounts to confirm this, that the referee would not be stopping the bouts. You or your team either called it quits, or you went unconscious. He was essentially there to determine if there was a finish or a foul. Bejedo simply panicked at the violence and stepped in. Telling MMA fighting years later, Horian came to me and asked, why did I stop the fight? And I asked him, why not? The guy is all bloodied up. 
Did John McCarthy's version of the events from Cage Side in his biography confirm Gracie's outrage at the stoppage? And in fact, after the doctor advised them not to continue the fight, Tooley himself confirmed in a 2016 interview with SureDog that his brother actually called the bout. When I think back to that time, I can only think how lucky I am that my brother threw the towel in. Because at that point, that's when I woke up and I knew, like, you know what I mean? And I don't know what I would have done. I would have took Gordo's throat or his balls off. Well, that's fun. Anyway, point being, not a single part of that matches up with what Wallace said besides that the people involved exist. Given how badly Superfoot's first claim struck out, I decided to then look into the next most implausible, the story of Art Jimerson's asthma and the smoke machines. Now, in the video, Wallace calls him a very good boxer who had asthma, so while they didn't name Jimerson specifically, he was the man representing boxing at the event, and one would assume, given the context, that they're talking about Art, especially considering that they show him on the screen as they discuss it. There's only one problem with this, though. Art Jimerson doesn't have asthma. Yeah. Unless he's kept this a secret to every person on the planet besides Bill Superfoot, there's not a single source anywhere on the internet or in books that corroborates this claim. Not to mention he certainly didn't look gassed. In fact, it was being terrified of an injury and his $20,000 appearance fee that made him and his management decide to tap at the first sign of trouble, which was when Hoist got the mount. Not because he couldn't breathe, but because he'd already been paid as much as everybody but the winner of the tournament and had a huge boxing match potentially with Tommy Hearns scheduled for just a few months later. So he couldn't afford to break a limb, a fear instilled in him by Big John before the event as he explained the horrors of the gentle art, as well as when he went backstage and saw the carnage. I go back to the dressing room and Ian walks Kevin Rozier with a broken jaw and I can actually hear his bones go side to side and he's trying to put his jaw back in place. Because I'm standing to it with uh, teeth missing from the front of my blood right out of his mouth. And one of my managers literally started crying and was chasing his ass saying, all right, don't do it. He's saying we're lawyers and uh, basically, um, you pull out what we got your back. So, okay, was this whole Gracie conspiracy video a joke? Wait, did Bill Wallace mean Zane Frazier had asthma and gassed out in his fight? Well, as it turns out, yes, because Zane did in fact have a severe asthma attack during his bout with Rozier. There's just one problem with the smoke machine accusation, though. Later, I find out they rushed me to the hospital, they intubated me, and they found out I had asthma. And I had never known I had asthma. I had never been diagnosed for asthma. I had what they call exercise-induced asthma, and I didn't know that. Well, that theory went right out the window. Not only did Frazier not know he had asthma, but earlier in the year at the World Karate Championship, Zane went into respiratory failure and purposely hid that fact from everyone, especially Art Davey and the Gracies, so that he would be allowed to compete at UFC 1, meaning there's no possible way they could have known that the smoke machine would eliminate Frazier from the competition, and he certainly couldn't request that they not use the smoke because he didn't know that he had asthma. Wasn't a Gracie's idea to have these dastardly machines, though, in case somebody had a breathing problem that they could explain? Exploit. Nope, it was SEG executive producer Campbell McLaren. I wanted a lot of drama, like a lot of fucking smoke. So Zane comes out, he's sucking in artificial smoke, he's got asthma, and he's at 5,200 feet. So he hits the octagon, and he's like... <gasps> All right, so fast, Billy was over too, and I was starting to think that maybe we were just gonna have to cancel this entire investigation and not even make a video. But I figured it's better to do my due diligence and see this through just in case something he had to say proved correct. So next, I wanted to investigate his claim that somebody was feeding him Gracie propaganda essentially during the broadcast. He specifically mentioned someone sitting right next to him. Wallace was in the middle between Jim Brown and Kathy Long, but I pretty quickly eliminated them as the potential Gracie mole feeding Bill lines. And while of course only he knows what was said to him on that night both potentially in person and in his production headset, I think he's referring to broadcast team member Rod Machado, who did sit down in the booth during the card, and yes, Rod was in fact a Gracie Jiu-Jitsu pupil. While it would seem that he was just there to make sure everyone understood the ground game, that was definitely not the case. When you look at the contributions made by Machado during the show, he's very much there to get across those classic Gracie talking points. Uh, it's kind of ironic that, uh, that Hoist Gracie is going to wear his judo top. Actually, Bill, it's, um, it will work in his favor. It'll be easier to uh, grapple with the guy. Yes, Bill, you know, it's interesting. 95% of the fights, according to uh, PD, police department studies, end up on the ground. It's, it's so hard to see sometimes, but that's the power of jujitsu. 
He was framing the entire event in that context, and the rest of the show seemed to fall in line so perfectly with it that it certainly raises suspicion. Not that it's surprising a Gracie student hired by a Gracie believed that Gracie was going to win, but there's no denying the bias. Hell, even Big John McCarthy, another Gracie pupil, said in his biography that, quote, I hadn't thought so much of the UFC as a vehicle for the Gracies, but to Horian, that's exactly what it was, an infomercial for Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. The ceremony honoring Elio right before the finals is another pretty clear indicator that even though SCG handled production, this was the Gracie show through and through. More evidence that the entire event was just a ploy to prop up business can be seen in the ads Horian would run in Black Belt Magazine before, and then directly the month after the event for his instructional tapes. Hoist's victory was fantastic marketing. In Jake Rossin's piece titled Starting a Fight, Big John is quoted about the boom in business created by the event. At the time UFC went off, Horian probably had 120 to 150 students. After that show, he had to have 500 that month. It just exploded. Along these same lines that this was all about selling gym memberships, do you know why Hickson Gracie wasn't chosen to represent the family in the event, even though he was the clear choice in terms of ability and physicality? The legend goes that Horian wanted to have Hoist do the show because he was the slider of the brothers, and it would show that the techniques taught in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu could take on all comers regardless of your size. But that's just Gracie lore. The reality that's been corroborated by multiple sources is that Hickson and Horian were not on good terms because Hickson had been training his own clients outside of the Torrance gym and was opening up his own academy, which Horian insisted have his brother's first name attached to it so that nobody could confuse the two brands and think that he was somehow affiliated with Horian's gym. And so because Hoist was still a member of his gym, the gym he had trademarked the Gracie name for use in the United States, that his lesser brother was chosen for UFC 1. All right, so Superfoot was one for three. But I mean, of course the Gracies want to prop themselves up. It's good for them, it's good for their business and jujitsu. That doesn't mean the event was rigged necessarily. Maybe they were just supremely confident in their system and strongly believed that they would prevail. Thus, a tremendous business opportunity. Next, I decided to tackle Bill's claim about specialized gear. Through my research, I found that a rules meeting held the night before the card almost exploded into an all-out brawl, and what fighters were and were not allowed to wear was the catalyst. There are at least eight or so separate accounts of this meeting that are very similar directly from the people that were in the room, which just lends more and more to the credibility that this is how things went down. Most of my information about it is coming from the 30 for 30 podcast episode about UFC 1, Clyde Gentry's book No Holds Barred, the article Starting a Fight by Jake Rawson, Art Davies' biography, and video interviews with some of the parties involved. At 7 p.m. the night before the event in the conference room of the Executive Tower Inn in Denver, Campbell McLaren, Horian Gracie, and Art Davey held a meeting to ensure all the fighters understood the rules and signed the waiver for the event. What was meant to be a quick and simple introduction went south very quickly. The biggest issue at the meeting was by far equipment, giving credence to what Wallace said in his video. Zane Frazier saw it as the Gracies changing the rules at the last minute, claiming that everyone had submitted information about the type of gear they used in their art and that it was approved beforehand. But the rules meeting would prove otherwise as no wraps could be worn that covered the knuckles, and if gloves were a part of their discipline's competitions, they must be six to eight ounces. Both Frazier and Jimerson in different sources called the situation, quote, See, now that's some bullshit and didn't even see the point of the gloves if they couldn't properly tape their hands. While Jimerson was not happy and would eventually famously walk out with a single glove, Frazier was straight up accusatory about the advantages he felt were clearly being given to Hoist, standing up to get in Horian's face and telling him in front of everybody, And it says, if you want to set us up to fight and to lose, hey, why don't the UFC can start right here, right now? I'll take your punk ass brother on right now. Horian dismissed the issue over the raps by the logic that you wouldn't have time to tape your hands before a street fight. Something Davey pointed out in his biography made little sense considering you also wouldn't have on your gi, which was permitted for hoist. The issue of shoes came up as well, as they were not allowed if you threw kicks, nor were shin, knee, or elbow guards. This of course was a problem for Ken Shamrock, who also felt the decision was made specifically to put him at a disadvantage. They took away my shoes because they knew that if they could take away my balance, that hoist would have a better chance of beating me. Shamrock has also gone on to say on numerous occasions that the advantage of the gi is the reason the finishing sequence of his fight with hoist ended with a choke and a loss instead of a leg lock and a win. By nearly every account, things got so heated that violence was imminent, leaving Davey unsure they'd even get everybody to agree to do the show. That was until Tila Tuli signed on the dotted line, slammed down his waiver, and this happened. I remember everybody quieted down and I, I looked at him and I said, hey man, I came here to party. If anybody came here to party, I'll see you in the arena tomorrow. After that, everybody else was ready to party. We're good! 
Hilarious side note, Kevin Rozier was off his ass on meds in the back of the room because he had a root canal earlier that day. Not ideal right before a cage fight. He also showed up around 100 pounds heavier than his fighting shape and looked awesomely like Meatloaf. The guy was a legend. Okay, so at this point, I was willing to give Mr. Bill Wallace a 50-50 now on his claims. As plenty of the fighters took issue with the equipment situation at the time and since the event, and the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu infomercial nature of the show was pretty apparent. Superfoot's final claim in my eyes, if true, was the most damning. That Horian hand-selected all of the fighters. And so I had to investigate just how it is that all seven non-Gracie combatants ended up on the card. In June of 1993, invitations began going out to all the top names in the combat sports world, with absolutely all of them ignoring this organization that had not a single event to their name. Even Chuck Norris, who was familiar with the Gracies and BJJ, refused to accept ringside seats because he wasn't sure about the legality of the event. Ads were placed in the backs of magazines like Playboy, Black Belt, and more localized martial arts publications in order to find fighters interested in doing the show. I tracked down the actual ad, and while it's in black and white here, you get the gist of it. You'll notice at the bottom it does mention as well to call matchmaker Hori and Gracie. Several of the combatants who ended up being chosen would answer this call to action. Rozier dialed them up after seeing the ad and lied about his size, again, just a legend. In Jonathan Snowden's excellent biography of Ken Shamrock, he explains that it was one of Ken's pupils from the lion's den that had reached out to the promotion after seeing their ad and suggested his coach. Ken also famously assumed the event was pro wrestling, essentially, until the first fight ended violently. According to Gentry, Ernest Hart, a former kickboxing champion, thought providing the UFC with a boxer, as they were actively looking for somebody ranked to do the show, would get him on the commentary team, and so he reached out to Art Jimerson about the idea. Gordo was approached by his coaches, who were asked specifically by the promotion if they had any talent to offer for the card. They wanted a sumo wrestler for the event as well and contacted the American Sumo Association, who then suggested Tila Tuli. Patrick Smith was found through an old contact in the kickboxing world that Art Davey had, and in part was chosen because he was a Denver local and might be able to sell house seats. Frazier's story is the best, though. On the day they intended to approach him to invite him to the tournament, Frazier was attending a martial arts expo and beat the shit out of Frank Dukes, the guy who claims Bloodsport is his real-life story. I mean, how could you not bring him on at that point? And so, there it was. Two fighters reached out in response to the ads, four were suggestions from contacts the team putting the show together made, and Kevin Frazier beat up Frank Dukes. Could these fighters have been chosen specifically because they were bad matchups for Hoist, though? According to Frazier, he had an inside source that confirmed it. They wanted a videotape. They wanted a uh, audition tape to see who, uh, if you are worthy enough to be in the tournament is what they said. We wouldn't send in a videotape because what we found out, there was a girl that I knew that was working for them. They said, hey, they're trying to steady different fighters to see who they can be. So we just sent in a videotape. There's only one problem with everything I've talked about as far as fighter selection up to this point. Horian wasn't in charge of selecting the fighters. Art Davey was. And that is according to every source I could find on the topic. In his biography, Davey explicitly stated, Horian never interfered with me when it came to the integrity of the event. The rules, the equipment, the matchups, the fighters that we signed. In fact, everyone's story seems to corroborate that Davey was the one making the calls, reaching out to fighters, trying to find talent. The only suggestion Horian made was Frazier, who he wanted because he was impressed that he could fight on the ground, as he witnessed him get into a brawl at a martial arts event. Apparently, Zane Frazier just got into a lot of brawls at martial arts events. The thing is, though, while it's true that Art Davey did seek out the talent, and in many cases tried to get far bigger and better names than they ended up with, like Leon Spinks, and Ernesto Hoost, Art was given one instruction from the Gracies in his search for fighters, and it's honestly a bombshell. In an interview Davey did with Joseph Santaliquido for a piece he wrote for SureDog titled Let There Be Fight, the UFC founder said, quote, No wrestlers. The Gracies didn't want anything to do with wrestlers. That limited us a little more. Son of a bitch. Superfoot, you got most of the details wrong about nearly everything, and yet we still somehow got to where we are right now. This revelation is massive and answers the question as to why a wrestler doesn't show up for the first time until UFC 4 in the form of Dan Severn, why it was the second event that featured a Sambo fighter but not UFC 1. With my investigation of Wallace's claims complete and this massive revelation that wrestlers were barred specifically at the request of the Gracies, I decided to stick to the evidence trail to see what else I could uncover that wasn't already discovered researching the Superfoot interview. What I found was an interesting account by Zane Frazier of the week leading up to the fight. Prior to the rules meeting, we had Brazilian chaperones 
taking us around to different gyms that they had designated that we could only work out in. So essentially what happened is that I was doing a drill with some, with some guys where I was punching the bag, kind of a blitzing bag, and I was doing double leg takedown and double down and pounding, elbow it and get back up. I was doing this drill. They videotaped that and they took it back to Horion. This was on Monday. So on Tuesday when I went back to the gym, I was trained for this as another guy named Carlos Valente. I'm naming names so you can check this out. Carlos Valente was watching me train. He goes, oh, these guys aren't going to want to fight you because you, how do you know Gracie Jiu Jitsu? That's kind of thing. There was also a section in Gentry's book where Gerard Gordeau claimed he was initially meant to compete against Hoist in the opening round of the tournament, but that it was switched at the last second because an SEG exec was told by Japanese media in attendance that Gerard was tough. John McCarthy did say in his bio that the only matchup Horian made that night was to pair Hoist with Art Jimerson initially, with his claim being that it was because boxing was such a significant art in the US, and he wanted Hoist to be the one to defeat it. Davey has explained that he was all over the place with the matchups till right before the event started, so that could explain why Gordo felt he was switched around. The Dutch fighter who broke his hand and would compete with some of Thule's teeth in his foot for the remainder of the tournament went on to say that the doctor warned Hoist about his injuries, and that Gracie used that to his advantage in their fight, only guarding against the other side of his body. He even went so far as to say that he got duped by the quote, Gracie Mafia. To be fair on that claim as well, it was kind of obvious which side Gordeau was banged up on by the finals. Then there was Big John's absence from the first event. A pupil of Horian, McCarthy immediately put an application in for the second UFC event, only to be pulled aside by Gracie and told, quote, what are you doing? You're with us and Hoist is doing this. You can't fight Hoist. You can enter when Hoist leaves. Gracie would then suggest that McCarthy McCarthy instead be the referee for the second event. Given his size and strength, and the fact that Hoist would struggle as well with the very strong, very big Kimo Leopoldo, it's not a stretch to say that given McCarthy's acumen in jiu-jitsu, along with his size and strength advantages, that he might have been able to defeat Hoist, and that they're encouraging him to be a referee was to ensure that didn't happen. Also notable about UFC 2, because that second card was moved to a smaller venue in Denver, the fighters no longer had dressing rooms. In Big John's gold mine of a biography, he talked talked about how the fighters were put up in a rundown drug den hotel across the street from the Mammoth Event Center and had to warm up and wait there to be ushered back to the arena when it was time for their bout, forced to traverse a pretty seedy alley between the two buildings. Everyone that is except for Hoist Gracie, of course, who had a room in the arena that I'm sure was much nicer than the hotel across the street. John even wrote, quote, Hoist found that being Horian's brother had its advantages. Indeed, Mr. Big, indeed. One other note, even with all we've discussed today, the scope of my investigation didn't scratch the surface really of the reputation, deserved or not, that the Gracie family has garnered over the years as it relates to competition, which is often frankly negative to a large portion of the community. Conflating victories, refusing to admit defeats, and making special caveats and rules for bouts that seemed advantageous to them, not to mention the mythologizing they do about their family. There's honestly too much to go into this late in a video, but like any investigation, the reputation of the suspects, for better or worse, is taken into account and I think it warranted at the very least bringing it up. Make no mistake though, I'm not here to make this a half hour of Gracie bashing by any means, and regardless of how you might feel about them, their contributions to the sport are beyond significant and vital to MMA's existence as we have it today. So even if I had found over the course of this investigation that every fighter at UFC 1 took a dive, it would still be hard to deny the positive impact the Gracie family's existence in mixed martial arts has had. When I took on this case following our Japanese Fixed Fights episode, I didn't expect there to be more information about a single event than about an entire era of the sport, but there is far more evidence here than we had last time. So with this pretty comprehensive investigation finally complete, let's start coming to some conclusions about the mystery we came here to solve. Was UFC 1 rigged? In the sense that the entire thing was a sham? Absolutely not. I do believe that Art Davey and the execs at SEG set out to make a legitimate competition that matched the vision of Hori and Gracie for this War of the Worlds concept. You can tell by the changes they made for UFC too, the fact that some grapplers were allowed, that matchmaking was randomized. They took to heart the criticism that the first event didn't seem fair enough in some aspects, and so from their perspective, I think they truly wanted this thing to be as fair as possible. That said, I do think everybody had an agenda beyond that. SDG and Davey wanted this thing to be financially successful, obviously, and that guided many of their decisions, from asthma-causing smoke machines to making sure that a sumo wrestler was included. They built this venture with the Gracies in mind, and they believed that jujitsu 
and the family would be as compelling to the audience as it was to them. As for Horian, he wanted this event to catapult Gracie Jiu-Jitsu in the US. This was an infomercial for their system. This was a way for them to make more money, get more students, open more gyms. Yes, they wanted to prove their art like their father before them, but there's more than enough evidence to show that UFC 1 was a business venture first and a way to honor the Gracie legacy second. All that said, even though I do think some of the claims and paranoia of the fighters at the first event needs to be taken with a grain of salt, there is more than enough evidence to suggest that the Gracies were doing everything in their power to ensure that Hoist would come out of this thing with a victory. Not to the point where had things gone bad, they would have suddenly changed the rules or something on the fly during the event, although I'm sure they would question the legitimacy of the loss, but in my opinion they absolutely set things up as best they could to stack the odds in their favor beforehand. Any one of these things we found today alone wouldn't paint that picture, but when you look at everything as a whole, it really does start to stack up. But like Tom Cruise said in A Few Good Men, it doesn't matter what I know, it only matters what I can prove. And that is why this topic has lingered for nearly 30 years. It's why a video like the Superfoot interview can garner 1.3 million views. Let's hope this one does too, fingers crossed. Because as much as it seems like we can draw conclusions here definitively, as much as we may feel very confident in UFC 1 being rigged in the sense we just discussed, there is no smoking smoke machine really. No clear-cut answers, even if the evidence feels like it's pretty comprehensively pointing in that direction. Was it truly an attempt to find the best martial art and artists in the world? I think we've answered that question today, and it's no. But calling it rigged is a pretty complicated claim. Hoist still had to win those fights, which is why fans, fighters, and media have, since the early morning of November 13th, 1993, drawn their own conclusions about what happened that night MMA was born in the United States, and why this case remains officially unsolved. All right, you made it to the end. Thank you so much. The feedback to our first entry in this series was seriously insane. Thank you all so much for the kind words. We really love putting these together, and I'm so excited for the next one. Please let us know what unsolved mysteries in MMA you want us to tackle next. And if you appreciated the video, a like and subscribe would go a long way. Thank you for watching, everybody. I'll see you for our next investigation.